next speaker, Johannes. Again, academic and university. Uh, so Johannes is a doctoral student at the Chair for System Security at the Ruhr University. Um, sorry, I misspeak. Bo Bochum, Bochum, yeah. in Germany. Uh, in this doctoral thesis, he focuses on the security of space and satellite system. Um, I think we've seen you last year. Yes. You were you were already presenting your job on uh, on the main stage, yeah. Uh, where he focuses so since many years now on uh, the security of space and satellite system with a special emphasis on understanding real-world security issues by studying otherwise how to access space software. His first paper on the security of onboard satellite software, Space Odyssey, an experimental to the software security analysis of satellites, was recently accepted to I3E SNP 2023 conference. Congratulations. In 2022, Johannes visited the Cyber Defense Campus in Switzerland for an extended research stay on satellite security where he investigated the security of ZSAT, VSAT sorry, systems. Um, talk today will be on LEO satellites. Um, you have a mic in front of you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Test, test. All right. Uh, hello, everybody. So uh, my talk will be Space Invaders and Experimental Security Analysis of Low Earth Orbit Satellites. And it's going to be a very technical talk, and by very technical, I mean technical, like we are going to see code, we are going to see actual vulnerabilities. Um, and there will be, if the presentation goes good with us, a working live demo where I exploit the digital twin of a satellite. And it will be the same satellite, by the way, that will be tomorrow on the main stage where they exploit the payload. But we will be exploiting the bus system. All right. So there was already a quick intro about me, so I'll shorten this, I guess. So my name is Johannes Wilbert. I'm a PhD student, as, uh, as you heard already. I'm also co-founder of the SpaceX workshop. That's an academic workshop where you can, in, can you, where you can in hand in research papers on this very topic here, on the security of space and satellite systems. I was a visiting researcher in Switzerland last year, and uh, I was already a sp speaker at CISA 2022. And this entire talk is basically based on my paper Space Odyssey in Experimental Software Security um, of Satellites and uh, as you already mentioned it was recently accepted to the IEEE SMP conference and uh, the presentation will be about mid-May about it. Okay, so in this talk um, I'm first going to introduce firmware attacks on satellites. So I'm going to talk about what our attacker model is and how we assume an attacker intacts with a satellite and what kinds of parts of the satellite we want to compromise in which order, what kind of vulnerabilities we need. So I will give you like an exact list of things you need to compromise on a live satellite um, to actually take it over. Then we are going, or I'm going to show you the security analysis of a real world satellite that will be the OPS set of ESA. Um, and I will be showing you some vulnerabilities in this code and then in the next part in live demo um, on my PC I have like a digital twin of the satellite that we built from the ground up like we implemented the instruction set from the very beginning uh, my student Florian Göhler who is also at a I think it's called Innovation Corner also has a booth he worked on it so if you have questions about that feel free, feel free to follow up with him and uh, finally I'm going to recap the lessons learned during the talk all right, so when we are talking about firmware attacks, I really mean attacks that target the satellite itself. It doesn't concern any ground segment, no ground station. We are really taking, like, for example, a strong enough SDR or whatever kind of like our own ground station, and we are talking directly to the satellite. Um, and on the satellite, we are then trying to exploit some vulnerabilities in, for example, the comm system, the, the control system, the bus system, to, to take it over. So we never actually interact with the operator itself. We never interact with anything on Earth. Um, and I think that's something that very much sets it apart from a lot of different attacks. So in the last talk, we heard about an attack um, where in 1980, 1993 or 1998, there was a satellite compromised by compromising the ground station, sure you can do that, but uh, I'm also going to show you that you can also do it without compromising the ground station. Um, and when we are talking about satellites, you first have to kind of like understand what we want to actually compromise to take over a satellite. So a satellite is compro composed of a bus system and a payload system. The payload is whatever the, the reason uh, the satellite is up there, like it has a camera, it has like fancy communications equipment, and the bus system is actually kind of controlling all that and is keeping it alive in space. And it consists of like an ADCS, an attitude determination control system, it like 
checks that the satellite is correctly orientated at all times, the power system, the EPS. We have a CDHS, that's a command and data handling system, so that's really the brain of the bus and that really controls all of the satellites. So if you're taking over the CDHS, you have a pretty good chance to compromise all of the payloads as well. And uh, finally, we have the comm system that is like connecting this entire bus system to the ground station. And uh, when we are talking about the attack path, um, we are really talking about an attacker that is talking to a comm system, for example, on the bus, then proceeds an attack to the CDHS, so the, the really the brain of the bus system, and then takes over the bus. Um, alternatively, there's also an attack path where you can take over the, the payload system um, through a, like, for example, specially dedicated uh, payload communication system. But we're going to focus on the top part. There's already quite some work on the on the payload part. Um, so, for example, Hexizer 2022 focused on that. Um, there's also a blog post by Maurice Michel uh, Didelo. I, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, there will also be a presentation uh, by Matteo Calabrese tomorrow, and there will also be Hexizer 2023 tomorrow, and they all focus on this payload system. Um, but we are going to focus on the bus system, which actually controls the payload. So in a, in a way, that's basically a level above that. Um, and when we are talking about an attack chain, what you actually need to compromise such a satellite, we are first talking about some bypass to the comm protection. So usually, satellites are supposed to have some kind of access control so that not everybody with a, with a like ground station they rented can just like talk to the satellite. Um, unfortunately, and you can check that in the paper, most satellites don't. Like there's no protection at all. Um, a lot of people say that just because people don't know how the protocols work is enough uh, protection, and they say it doesn't stated this in our survey because people don't know the frequencies, don't know the, don't know the modulations, they can't talk to the satellite. Um, so it's really like a security or obscurity mind uh, that is out there. That's not really how security works. Um, but there are a lot of different ways how you can bypass the comp protection. The, in the protocol that is used to communicate might just be insecure, like we have seen it countless times on Earth, so why wouldn't it be different on, uh, on a satellite? Might be outdated crypto, satellites are a long time in space, so crypto might be outdated. There are timing side channels that you can maybe exploit, especially with these like lower end old processors, um, where you can, for example, brute force with a timing side channel a signature um, of, of some telecommand and then actually send a malicious telecommand. There might be leak keys, there might be timed backdoors. There might be so many things that the comp protection is not sufficient um, that you, you might eventually find one, one of these issues. So really when we have a bypass to the comp protection, we are basically on the satellite. And on the satellite, we need to somehow deploy our attacker payload. One way would be to upload a new firmware image on the satellite. This has quite some problems. Images might be signed so that you can't do that. Um, upload might be pretty slow when you have a yeah, like UHF or VHF antenna. Uh, upload of a new firmware image might take several days. Um, that's enough time for operators to react and see that somebody's uploading like a pretty big thing to the satellite and take some countermeasures, so not ideal. Also, we want to have the satellite now, not in like a few days, so that's also not exactly convenient. Um, and lastly, we have a, not a complex, a complex system, um, so it's not maybe necessarily easy to just build a new firmware for like a f somebody else's satellite. So uploading a firmware to a new satellite to a satellite that you're trying to take over, not impossible, but certainly not convenient. So different way that we can look uh, to take over a satellite would be through dangerous telecommands um, or vulnerable telecommands. And dangerous telecommands are really telecommands that are, s that are doing things, that are changing stuff on the satellite that are beneficial to an attacker. So that, 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 is, that sounds very complex, but uh, I'll show you in the, in the like security analysis what I mean. But basically it might be, for example, a telecommand that allows us to take over the satellite without writing a full firmware image. For example, just patching a few bytes. Um, and ultimately there might be vulnerable telecommands um, where there's just a vulnerability, like a classical software vulnerability in the telecommand itself that allows us for code execution. And when we have that and we can do deploy our attacker payload on the bus system or on the CDHS, um, we need to hijack the control flow on the bus, so we really need to take over like the control routine of the satellite, whatever is running, for example, on the operating system, and then we need to a s advance our attack to a, like a full bus privilege so that we can really do whatever we want on the satellite itself. And uh, if we do all that and everything works well, then we might have ourselves our own satellite that was never meant to be our own satellite, really. 
So to conclude the objectives that we are searching in the next like a few minutes in the security analysis, we want to have to we want to be able to bypass the comp protection. We want to be able to find a dangerous or vulnerable telecommand. We want to hijack the bus control flow, and finally we want to have the full bus privileges. So we need to like elevate our privileges. And with that, let's go to the security analysis. And our target for the security analysis will be OPSSAT. And I'm sh pretty sure a lot of people have already heard about the satellite. It's operated by ESA. Um, it's a really a research satellite, so you can build your own experiments in like a Java framework, upload it to this uh, pretty interesting ARM-based Linux uh, thing that is running on the satellite. It has an FPGA if you need some more of a complex uh, experiment with a little more computing power. It has really all the peripherals you, you might want, like you have an S-band, an X-band antenna, you have an SCR, optical receiver, camera, and then a lot more stuff. Um, so really, it's a pretty cool research thing, for not just for security researchers, but also for security researchers, uh, mainly because we got a software of it. Um, all right, so this is basically a very stripped down system chart. So you, if you've seen presentations about OPS before, you've probably seen this like gigantic thing with like a million lines all over the place. So this is not exhaustive, but it's meant to be able to give you an idea on what the satellite really has. So we have the, we have the bus system that I talked previously about. So we have the comm system that is a UHF antenna. And that is, uh, for example, used to send telecommands and get telemetry from the satellite. We have a GPS module that is pretty self-explanatory. We have the EPS and ADCS, so power and uh, attitude control system. And then we, we have this entire payload. So we have an X-band antenna, we have an S-band antenna, and they are both connected to like a CCSDS engine that is, uh, well, as the name implies, uh, implementing the CCSDS protocol stack to um, allow for more communication, not just over the CHF antenna. And then we have this SCPP, so this uh, experimental experimental platform, and that is really having all these like nice uh, peripherals that are pretty interesting for research, like a better ADCS. So this is just a very coarse ADCS. Obviously, for an optical receiver, you need a little bit more than that. Um, and we have a camera and SDR and a lot more stuff. Okay, so first point on our list, we want to bypass the comp protection. Where can we do that? The x band is just a transmitter; it's not a receiver. So that's out. The S band is a receiver, so we can stuff on the S band. We can send stuff on the S band antenna, but we are not entirely sure what the CCSDS engine is doing. Um, and by that I mean some documents specify encryption, some don't. So we don't want to deal with that. We can just use the comm system, like this UHF antenna, because this has no protection at all. Like there's nothing preventing you from using or sending telecommands to the satellite right now, except that you don't know how the protocol looks like. And if you do, you can just send stuff to the satellite and it will accept it. There are even protections in the code. Um, for example, they're using the CubeSat space protocol, but all the protections have been disabled by a compile time flag. Um, so there we have it, there we have our start. Pretty underwhelming that our bypass for comp protection is affected. There is just no comp protection, but unfortunately, as our survey showed, that is mostly the case. Right, so we have that. And next, we are looking for a dangerous or vulnerable telecommand. And as said, we are looking for this on this like CDHS, since this is the running, since this, this is handling telecommands that are sent up to the satellite. Um, so, so this is not code from OPSAT. Um, so usually when we are looking for like a vulnerable telecommand or especially for a dangerous telecommand, we're looking for a basically a mem copy as a telecommand. So a lot of satellites basically have just a mem copy telecommand, and this is basically the best thing you can find as an attacker. So this is one of these telecommands, for example. Um, and really what it does is takes uh, it takes the telecommand packets p command, and it just extracts some arguments from that. And it then calls a memcopy function with just arguments provided from the telecommand. So what this allows an attacker is to really send a, an actual address in the memory of the satellite, send contents and the length, and write precise amounts of memory. And this might be a full firmware image, which, as we discussed, is not useful. But it might also be just 20, 30, 100 bytes, which is one telecommand package. And then you can write over or hijack the or can inject your own code um, and you can take over the control flow, you can write over whatever address you want. So if you find that as an attacker, that is really kind of the, the holy grail as far as dangerous telecommands go. And uh, 
Why would people have that in the first place? Well, to make easier config changes, they don't want to upload a full like configuration file again. They just want to like do one quick change and don't upload the full file. Um, they want to do hot patching, so they also don't want to upload a full new firmware image because it takes time. So they use this same same thinking as the attacker, really. Um, or maybe you just want to use it for debugging. So there are a lot of different reasons. Unfortunately, we didn't really find this on OPS set. Um, so we really need to find or look for something else. And when we are taking a closer look at the CDHS, um, we have basically the first command stack, that is the CubeSat space protocol that I mentioned already. And that is connected, for example, to the ADCS server where you can uh, check for the current position, you can check GPS data, there's a parameter database where you can basically get all the like thousand or whatever parameters that are stored on the, on the satellite. But you can also use, for example, this like CSP to SPP. SPP is a space packet protocol from the CCSDS stack that I talked earlier about. Like this is actually connected or meant to be used with the CCSDS engine, but there is actually like this interesting like cross channel to this S space packet protocol. And to do handler name, a lot of handler names that uh, I unfortunately forgot to implement. I'm very sorry for that. Um, so really, this is uh, these these handler have like a lot more functionalities. Um, so you you can you can send you can upload new files to the flash. You can set a different boot image. So this is really meant to like upload a new firmware. Um, so this is using this message abstraction layer, and there you really define like a, for example read a bool, read like a size list, read integers. So it's it's not exactly something you're looking for as an attacker since the parsing seems to be done rather well-ish. What we're really looking for is like custom byte parsing, since there usually the, the vulnerabilities are. Um, and it, it turns out we actually get rewarded for that since we found a vulnerability there. So when you are using a space, the space packet protocol, uh, CubeSat space protocol, sorry, and set a command to the, ta to the ADCS server, you get to come into this function, to this nice function, task ADCS server. There are a lot of different commands and it's obviously a very stripped down version of the function, but the way it works is essentially we have a uh, regular server set up as you might know it from Linux programming or really any network programming. We are listening on, a, on some port or we are, we are setting up a socket, we are binding it to some port, we are waiting for connections, we accept the connection and then read packet data. Really straightforward. Um, and this is also how it works on satellites in case you, you, you haven't seen this before. And uh, then we have this interesting piece of code and people that uh, do some security analysis should see the, the issue right there. Um, we're having a static buffer and uh, we, we take a part from the payload that is on the telecommand and we are concatenating it into the string buffer. And there is no size delimination. So this is basically a textbook buffer overflow that allows us to, to hijack the control flow as I will show you in the demo. So when you write over this buffer, so essentially a little bit more than 32 bytes, you will eventually overwrite part of the stack where uh, program address was stored. And as soon as we leave the function, this address is called and we've hijacked the control flow. So this little piece of code is all we need and we can already hijack the control flow. So cool, we, we have our vulnerability C and I already said we can hijack the control flow with that. Technically, in current modern systems, that is not true because there are a lot of defenses against this stuff because this was discovered in the 90s and since then people have come up with quite some defenses. For example, operating system level defenses like uh, addre address space layout randomization where you don't know the actual address that you that you are supposed to write in there or just a non-executable stack so that certain areas of the code are just non-executable or not, not the code but certain parts of the data area are just non-executable or there might be software defenses like a stack cookie where you place a little icon or little little cookie um, somewhere on the stack so that when you override it, the program notices that and says, no, you, you, you can't do that. You, you broke something and you're clearly not meant to write stuff here. Nothing, no, none of these things is there. Like this, this real-time operating system doesn't even support any of these. Technically, an uh, NX stack is supported and even the processor does it, but we found no hints in the code that this is actually set up or used in any way. Um, also, the software definitely does not use any software defenses like stack cookies, so really none of the state-of-the-art defenses that we developed over the last 30-ish years are used on the satellite. So vulnerability C and hijacking the control flow is really the same in this case. Okay, next we need the full bus privileges. Again, 
that will be pretty underwhelming since this real-time operating system doesn't have a system of privileges. As soon as you execute code, you execute it in like the, the, the same binary that is controlling the bus system. There, there is no distinction like on Linux or like on Atoms, for example, has a similar privilege system or at least has a privilege system, but this real-time operating system just doesn't. So again, underwhelming. But we've got our four points. There's no comp protection. We found a vulnerability C where we can take over in like a 90 style buffer overflow the entire thing. We can hijack the control flow because there are no defenses. Um, and really, there are no defenses. And then we can take, and then we already got the privileges that we need because there's no privilege system. And with that, we come to the demo. So we are not going to exploit the, the real satellite. We are going to exploit like a a digital version, digital twin that we built over the last, um, yeah, basically two years at this point. Um, so it's a, it's essentially a chemo emulation for people that that are working with this kind of stuff. That this is like a go-to emulator for all kinds of software, also for desktop software, but also for firmware software. And uh, on top of that, we built this AVR32 architecture. So this is the architecture used in the satellite. And people that are familiar with chemo maybe notice that AVR32 is not supported by Chemo. We implemented this from the ground up, like from the very scratch. We implement every instruction handler, every kind of instruction, every interrupt handler, every I2C handler, and so on. And after you do that for quite some time, it turns out you can actually run uh, the, the software from the satellite in it. And it actually works, works ra rather well. And then you just have to implement some sensors and like a UHF antenna, quote unquote. Um, and then you can even access the telecommand handlers with like a nice Python script as though you would be executing it on a real satellite. Then we put like a simulation agent to it that connects this entire simulation like nicely by TCP to like our attacker and our attacker is in this case just the Python script that sends the telecommand. Um, in the future, we're also planning to like extend this a bit to like, for example, send sensor values to the simulation agent from, from some uh, software that is, is used for these kind of digital twins. I assume I'm pretty sure there's stuff. Um, and then, for example, the, the simulation agent sends the flight maneuvers that were done by the satellites to this uh, simulation and send the, gets the sensor values back. So that ultimately we have like a full running emulation. Right now, only the, f the first part is done, and this is what I'm going to present. All right. So uh, let's hope that, uh, let that this works. I'm not entirely sure I do it with the micro because I need both my hands. So what we're first doing is just starting the satellite. Um, really, what we, what we you will be seeing, uh, trying to make this a bit larger, is that after some time of setup time, like it's going through like a like an FRAM where it reads configuration. You see like okay, it's reading a, like a gyro uh, gyroscope. It's reading a temperature sensor. It's reading measurements. So that's really after the setup time, what the satellite is doing, right? It's it's just checking what is what's going on and it's trying to react to it. So in the next part, we are going to to send like a first regular telecommand. So we are first requesting a task list from the satellite. So just to show you that we, we can send regular telecommands in this is the exact same like format that the real satellite would be sending. So we are seeing basically a list of tasks that are running. Um, so we have like an ADCS task, we have like some idle task, we have an initialization task um, that is still running. So actually the, the initialization takes quite some time, too long to like go through it in the entire presentation. And there are a lot of different processes, like there's a blinking LED and a lot of more stuff. So we can get a task list. So that's pretty cool. So that's Next, we can send our payload. And what our payload is doing is we're basically locking down the telecommand handler. So we're going to execute code. Uh, we're going to, to execute code on the satellite. Um, and with that, overwriting a part of the like receiver code that is taking stuff from the antenna. And we are rewriting it so that we are basically inserting a key that from now on, operators have to send or have to like encrypt their header of the protocol well, presentations got don't mean it good with us, apparently. I have no idea what this problem is right now. Um, let me check. It 
doesn't really want to work, and I don't know why. I tested it about three minutes ago when I was sitting there. That's just how live demos are, really. I, I'm really sorry. Um, don't worry, you can still see the demo. Uh, I can show to you, or my colleague Florian Güller can show to you on our booth. Um, what would have happened is we send a telecommand, and then in the next step we would have again tried to send a task list command, the very same command, and it would have done nothing because we have patched the receiver code to require a key. So in the next step what we would have done is send a task list again, but this time, it's really hard to see, encrypt the, the header with a, with a key. And then it accepts the task list. Unfortunately, it's not working. It, it, it was working about three minutes ago. Uh, it's, it's really sad. I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, that's what live demos are really, I think. Um, so yeah, with that, live demo successfully failed, I guess. But we would be able to take over the satellite, I promise you, and you can see it at our booth. And we can really patch the command handler to lock, for example, ESA operators out. It worked. Um, and then it's our satellite, really. The next step would be to, for example, write this like persistently into the flash image so that then we reboot the satellite, our tech or our payload is still there. Um, and with that, let's go to the lessons learned in the talk. So firmware attacks on satellites are a thing. Um, I've shown you the vulnerabilities. You've shown the successfully failed live demo. Um, so what you really need is just TC execution is maybe not enough, so you really need to find like some dangerous or vulnerable telecommand because uploading a firmware or stuff like that is usually not good enough. And usually there are no telecommands that let you, for example, encrypt a file system so you can exert a ransomware or something like that. So th the stuff that you want to do as an attacker is usually not there. So you need to like be able to do your own stuff. So just TC execution is not good enough. Um, and part of the attack was so easy because there are just no state-of-the-art defenses. Like in the security community, we were developing stuff for like 30 years and like not a th single thing has arrived at these satellites. That's pretty uh, mindly infiltrating, let's say it like that. And ultimately, we were able to do it with like a 90 cyber buffer overflow in a space system. So people are always arguing, okay, we want to like prove that our space system works. Like we want to formally verify it. And then we find like 90 cyber for overflows. And this was not the only one. We found one in the like file system management library that was, for example, when you move a file, if the like file target is longer than 128 bytes, you get a buffer overflow into code execution. When even like your move file function is vulnerable to a buffer overflow, you really should reconsider your choices of libraries, to be honest. Um, but it's also not getting better that this like library that was used is like unmaintained for 15 years. So maybe not a good starting point for a space system in the first place. All right. Thanks for the talk and uh, thanks for listening. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Yeah, we have two online actually. Uh, I've set up one full screen. We'll read it. We will read it together. Well, I've re uh, I will read it. And and for people asking for the slides, it will be on my website. So just uh, search for jwillbolt.com and the slides will be there in a few days. So two questions actually from the same person, Matteo. Um, yeah. No, the, the that's a problem. No, the, there, is, there isn't any authentication. There's no password. There's no thing that we would have patched in. Even like with like our exploit, the satellite would have been more secure in a way since like then there would be at least some kind of password. No, th there is no authentication. That's that's the point. That's the issue. Okay. And next one. So the Rust programming language has proven that it's actually pretty good at preventing these kind of issues. Um, you're right that ASLR, canaries, non-executable memory are only making it more difficult. Um, but they're making it more difficult to the point that we, for example, need like an additional information leak, ex especially for ASLR. And with that, it would have certainly been more difficult. I mean, these defenses are implemented in all operating systems and software for a reason. Um, and the reason is that, yes, they're making it not impossible, but they make it certainly harder. And easier as that, y you can't get it easier than that. I have a lot of questions for you, actually. <laughs> <laughs> One from Cesar. So as I said in one of the slides, there are actually really a lot of ways to, to mitigate 
even authentication. One interesting attack is, for example, a timing side channel, especially wi with these very old processors. Um, you can actually measure timings of um, how long it takes to, for example, process a telecommand. Um, with an S-band antenna, maybe it's feasible that you, for example, send, for example, a thousand or a hundred telecommands that all basically have a wrong signature. But you always measure the timing. You always send change, for example, one byte of the um, of the of the signature. And as soon as you guess the right byte, one tiny loop in the processor m and the processor might be going one loop further, and that's taking a little bit more time. And this is like a classic timing side channel and how you can like bypass authentication. This only works if the call is already vulnerable, if they're checking the signature correctly. That this is not going to work. Um, but there are a lot of ways, like. Um, Bypassing crypto is not my field, like I'm doing software security, but as I listed, there are a lot of ways to do this. Thank you. We have many interesting questions. Uh, maybe two last ones, the other will we'll, we'll rewrite answers. Um, absolutely. Uh, why why wouldn't you be able to have reliability with an, with a stack cookies or really ASLR or just non-executable stacks? Really, you need just a processor feature like memory protection units to implement that. Um, I can see that, for example, ASLR would be kind of worrying for people because it's just adding randomness into the whole process. Um, but really, like every computer system on Earth is pretty like server system, I should say, is is running with these measures. So. I think it works. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, last one, I think. So, since we were technically not really looking into the CCSDS stack, um, I'm not sure what CDM is in that context. Um, there, there are obviously people looking into the CCSDS stack, um, but but I can't really talk on that since I I don't know about that. So maybe one 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 last um sure. since you work on uh, upsets. Um so these standard stuff or standard POS stuff and stuff is only used on this like um different control channel that I showed you, like over this S band antenna with the space packet protocol that's actually using CCSDS. This antenna that we exploited uses a communication protocol or stack that is using this CubeSat space protocol. And all of the stuff is non-sanitized. There's nothing sanitized about this. So there is no either specific stuff in there. OK, thank you. Uh, we had question about the resource and live demo. Maybe you will set up video on your website, you said, and you will have a booth. But people are still online, and they are asking for videos. So Absolutely. Um, I, I can do a video after the conference. But this will, this, this will take a few days. And okay. there will also be, so I will also be presenting a demo on, for example, other conferences like Recon in Montreal. Um, so maybe join in there and then you can see it there as well. Okay, thanks a lot.